not sure why I'm here. I said, baby, what's, what's going on in your life? Well, my boyfriend's cousin comes into town every six months and we hook up and he pays our rent. Well, that's the epitome of prostitution. That's exactly what it is. You don't have to. You should not have to trade sex for anything. And many of us that are even being in the life for as many years as I was, I didn't know that I was really in prostitution because it's what you do to survive every day. You sleep with the dope man. I didn't place ads. I didn't walk up and down the street. But I was sold lots of different times in lots of different ways. And, and um, I want to get off that and back to housing. But so I, what I want to say is that some of the folks that are going to come to your churches and that you're going to be working with don't necessarily identify. A lot has to do with the stigma. A lot of it has to do with shame and guilt and things like that. Okay, now I remember what I was getting at before. Okay, so you take the vulnerability, the unmet need, and you have someone that comes along with a false promise. And that creates the dynamic of prostitution. So that's what we want to look at. Now, back on the point. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, housing is, is a big need. Food, clothing, shelter. We have a drop-in center for folks to come to. They don't necessarily want to get out the life right now. They're, they're beat up, whatever. And that's okay. That's okay. What we do is we'll, we'll speak with them. We'll talk with them if they want advocacy. If they don't, that's, what's, that, that's cool, too. You go upstairs. You take a shower. We have showers. You can sleep. We have a TV up there that was donated during Super Bowl because um, we were open for the 12 days leading up to the Super Bowl. And um, that TV's never been on. This isn't for people to just come and sit back. These are people that are tired. They're tired, they're homeless. They gotta go back out there at night. We're only open nine to five because the city won't let us stay open 24 hours. Um, so we allow them to do that, but we're planting seeds. And they may come back later. Or maybe they won't come back at all. That's okay. That's okay, because we're still gonna love them and we're still gonna provide them with that. We also have an emergency shelter. Um, and and um, they're really expensive to run y'all. So if you just do the math, so let's say one of y'all have a house, like the gentleman before was talking about realtors and developers and things like that. If you have a house and it's four bedrooms or less, you go to, you can go in there and you can set that up as an emergency shelter. You don't have to be licensed as long as there's four or less unrelated people staying there. Okay, so, but you do need coverage, because you don't want to just open this house up and not have it, uh, staff there. So if you take just $18 an hour times 365 times 24 hours a day, it's $166,000 just for minimum coverage. Wow. It's a lot of money. And i got to come up with that every year. And, and it, it, it's not funded by OJP, which is the Department of Justice, or most of our other grants. So this is Gen Ops money that we got to come up with. And that's a lot of money. And that's not including food, the clothing, towels, all that other stuff. But we do use the community for that kind of stuff. We have a local Christian radio station, KTIS, that Natalie Brandt came in town. And everyone that went to the concert had to bring a set of towels. And now we can give those towels to the gals when they leave, because they take them anyway. Um, because we need them, and we're okay with that. I mean, I remember one summer when it was so hot, we all came in, and our air conditioner was out of the window, and we're like, we ain't even mad. You know, someone needed this more than we did, because it, it's hot out there. Um, so it's just meeting people where they're at. Domina. Yes. Um, first of all, I think it's important, and I'm so loud anyways, but um, I was told I have to use this for the recording. I think it's important to let folks know where you came from before you were in the life. Before I was in the life, I was a, a praised farmland for the county assessment, and I was in the United States Army. In what state? In, uh, came from Kankakee, Illinois. Oh my gosh, I'm from Kankakee. But you know, you 
Pardon? Do you know any loves? Loves. loves. The last name loves? The last name loves. Yeah. No, my uncle was the first black police officer. And I have um, another uncle who was the president of the school board and was the first black alderman at the age of 21. So I come from a family, you know, I wasn't raised in the streets or anything. But I got involved in drugs. And I was a dope dealer, girlfriend. And he left me for another girl, and I went to the streets. And I was out there for 26 years before I found my way back to breaking free. I've been out the life for eight years. I now sit as the vice chair on the board of directors for breaking free. So one of the things that we do is we are a survivor-led organization. We're all survivors. Um, not all of us have had the opportunity to complete um, our education. Um, many of us got, were sexually abused at seven, eight, nine years old, ran away at 12, were picked up by a pimp, were trafficked for many years. So we might have a seventh, eighth grade education. Some of us go back later. Um, but um, it's important to empower us. It takes a lot of time to work with survivors. It takes more time to, to teach skills. Hey, y'all, we got skills. We got transferable skills. Okay, so even if we're coming out of the life today, I am really good at customer service. Okay? <laughs> you know, I might not be opening up a daycare or working in a bank, but there's a lot of stuff we can do, and we're going to be walking this way. We are not lots white. We are not looking back. Okay? This is about moving forward and empowering all of us, and it takes extra time. We've got trauma. The whole ride up here, we were talking about the trauma. What was that one thing you were talking about? What is that thing that goes down the our spine? The polyvagal nervous system. The, po the vagal nervous system, the polyvagal theory and the nervous system that goes through your spine and it can and it's what works all of your like uh, the breathing and all of your organs and everything and when you and it we have the reptilian part of our brain and then the thinking part of our brain and it's all connected so when you experience trauma and you do that fight flight or freeze or the defend flight or freeze um, we were talking about it and we were saying when you experience trauma your body is what responds not your thinking brain. It's that part of your brain that's the oldest part of our brain that tells us what to do in that trauma situation. And so when you look back on a situation and you go, why didn't I run? Why didn't I bite him? Why didn't I whatever? Because your body would not allow you. Your body was protecting you and saving your life in that moment. And you were not capable of thinking. And yeah, and it can, and it can cause a lot of our women have IBS and um, all kinds of stomach problems and all kinds of issues because your body, uh, because of the wiring system, and there's so much more. Exactly. So that's another way you can help at the churches. Have people that are clinicians. Have people that are licensed as attorneys because we all come with some baggage. We've all been locked up a time or two. And so to, to help us with some of these expungements, um, um, to help us, so we have a therapist that comes in every Friday that does ED, EMDR therapy for this. Another thing that's important is to just explain to us what the hell is going on. You know, to have therapists that understand. So when I get in there and I talk about how I was raped at 15, but I didn't know that I was raped because I didn't scream and yell, and I was was um, I was um, laying there like this. I, I I froze, but then I was sharing that I never shared before as we were coming up here. When this rape was going on and on and on, I ended up starting to kiss this man and gross. Why did I do that? 
You know, why did I do that? And other boys that might be raped might think, um, because they got an erection, that, that they wanted it. That's not what it is at all. That's a response of our body. And what happens to our mind when we're in these trauma situations? How do we get out of them? How do we just don't just dissociate and leave it there? We got to process this stuff. And that's why uh, another thing we do is we're partnering with chemical dependency organizations throughout the Twin City area because we know there is an intersection between chemical dependency and prostitution, sexual exploitation. Many of us that are chemically dependent slept with the dope man. Now, does that mean we gotta put a label on you? No, no, that's not what we're talking about. But we gotta acknowledge that this happened to us so that we can move forward. And that's something that doesn't happen in chemical dependency arenas. So take a look at some of the new ways that we can affect interdictions. And what an interdiction is, is if you map, you know, um, where, where perpetrators are, where the demand is, the buyers, um, et cetera. Find out what these systemic places are and see what you can do to affect the change. So, Demita, I want you to talk a little bit more about um, the demand. About the demand. We have what's called <laughs> Men Breaking Free. It's a John school, if you will. So we work with the men that purchase women, and we don't take the Lorraine Bobbitt approach. Okay, so we're not about chopping out penises. We're about talking to the men and saying, Bobbitt. What was going through your mind when you first purchased sex? Oh, you were at a stag party at Madison and you were drunk and you thought that it was mutual. Or Pamela, oh, you're Hispanic and it's a rite of passage into adulthood and you were, your mom brought you to a brothel in the bandit. Now that happened a lot. Um, oh, you were Asian and you're a virgin and um, you thought it was... Um, Again, because of Julia Roberts and a lot of normalization of sex, they think that it's a mutual thing, and it is not a mutual thing. So we talk to them. We've got to find out what it is. What were those messages that were going through your mind? And then we talk about it. We say, what does it mean to be a man? Put that in the back of your head as we're going through this day. We have women come in and talk about it. Uh, we give our testimony. We get the, this is when a lot of times the guys start crying and they say, we're sorry, we didn't know. And this is when our healing starts too. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, Damina, why don't you talk a little bit about... Um, to address the demand, um, the, okay, we address the roots of what is driving the demand for men to purchase sex. So in other words, you find out what's really going on with you, where that you think it's okay for you to just go out and purchase this 15-year-old girl. Or she might even be 11 or 12. Um, you talk about the harms of pornography and how it leads to an erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And about more pornography and prostitution. Talk about the influence of the commercial sex industry on destroying families and influencing our culture in ways that foster the exploitation of others. Organize speaking events at local churches on the reality of foreign addictions. Provide those in the community with the list of resources of porn addiction, establish a crisis line for men to all when they feel tempted to purchase somebody. So, thank you, Tamina. Mm -hmm. So we have a 24-7 line where our, we have a man that answers the phone. So if somebody calls at 3 o'clock in the morning and they feel like they want to go down to one of our whole strolls, which is what we call where people still walk, because people think this is all done on the internet. That's not true. No. That's not true at all. In fact, 40% of our women are work on the streets. And a lot of that has to do with because we're African American, because we're Native American, because we're um, transgender. It's way, and, and a lot of times you need a credit card to post ads and things. And we don't always have that. 
And it's much less risky for me to hop into a car if I'm a trans than have my picture up there and to allow someone to spend an hour or two trying to figure out what they're going to do with me. You know what I'm saying? It's 50-50 no matter what, whether you're going to be killed or not or hurt or whatever. I mean, that, those are just the odds. You just don't ever know. So it's less risky sometimes to just hop in a car. Or you may have a gorilla pimp that says, bitch, you better come back with, you know, three, four hundred dollars within the next two hours. In fact, just to give you a little bit of a uh, uh, understand wh what we have to do on a daily, the average amount of money in Minnesota, which is probably the same in, in Wisconsin, maybe a little less, is between eight and twelve hundred dollars a day. In New York and Chicago, it might be three thousand a day. In Alabama, Mississippi, it might be what? Two fifty, two hundred, three hundred a day. Yeah. Um, so that's the quota, and, and it depends on what the uh, economic position is of that state. Um, I want to make sure we go through all these things. So the awareness and the prevention. We're going to group that into two. Um, Tony? For awareness and prevention, I think a really good piece is allowing us to come in to your church and speak with the kids. Um, I'm not sure what it's called, like confirmation? Is um, that? Maybe the other kids, I don't know. The but, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's in a cat. Okay, but I, I don't know if Protestant has. I love the Catholic Church, too, just like the guys around the So, but we did go in and um, we had talked to the kids, um, give them um, red flag tips and prevention tips. And I remember one of the little, um, one of the little boys, he stood up and his question was, well, how, what can I do to help these women? And I was like, well, don't buy, you know? But um, I think a really powerful one is for, especially the men in the churches, um, to be that positive role model for um, our children.